gonna give a brief herbicide resistant management update because I do run the herbicide screening program at OSU. Um, and basically that's a free service to anyone in the state of Oklahoma, where if you think you have herbicide resistant weans, you can send in seed samples to me and I have directions online on how to do it. If you just Google my name, Misha, weeds, OSU, um, herbicide resistance, a fact sheet will come up and there's instructions on the back side of that sheet and that I should have brought some hard copies but we're all so savvy on our phones now. Misha herbicide resistance and you can find that sheet pretty quickly. Um, and basically we'll screen, we'll grow out the plants, we'll spray them with herbicides that are have interest to you and I'll tell you what's working and what's not working and hopefully provide you with some kind of plan is the goal. Um, so I always show this slide and I get asked a lot to remind folks on how herbicide resistance occurs. Um, and the most important word on this slide is selection. That we already have weeds present in our field that will not respond to herbicides. And when we apply the same herbicides over and over again, we select for them. So what I said earlier about sandburg, sandburrs in Bermuda, I know there are some sandburrs in Oklahoma that are not gonna be killed by glyphosate. They already exist. So what happens is when we get really comfy with something that works, like maybe going out with that glyphosate product a couple of times, we find those plants because we're not killing them and they reproduce. And when those plants reproduce, so here's a plant reproducing, then eventually its offspring, which are probably also resistant, they start to take over our fields. And that can happen very quickly. I mean, I've seen it happen with pigweed and glyphosate in several years, three, four, five years, you go from no plants to virtually a whole field. So it's pretty devastating. And I like what Brian said about herbicides being a Band-Aid. They really are a Band-Aid, and they're a Band-Aid because of this, because we have herbicide resistance. And so even though we like using herbicides because a lot of the times we can find things that work well, a lot of products have gone off patent and we can get them for relatively inexpensive prices, we need to be using them with other management tools. Um, so I'm gonna talk about management. First, do a quick update talk about some of the different herbicide family groups. Um, our ALS products, so these are um, our Emmys. Brian talked about a Mazepic. If you are in wheat, who here works in wheat or spraying in wheat, killing weeds in wheat? Okay. Um, your Ally, your Finesse, um, Chlorosulfuron, Metsulfuron, a lot of the products that end in U-R-O-N. Those are in the ALS family. They're also, if you look at a herbicide label and you don't pay attention to the active ingredients, this is anything that has a two on it. These are group two herbicides. Group two herbicides, um, we have used quite extensively in the state of Oklahoma because they work really well and they're cheap. And so we do have a lot of resistance issues. And these are some of, not all of, but some of the weeds where we have resistance ryegrass, palmer, amaranth, tall water hemp. So one thing that you'll see as I go through these slides is the pigweeds are basically on every single resistance group. Pigweeds have evolved resistance to almost every mode of action that we have. Um, and that's just unfortunate and it means its biology is incredibly adaptive. Um, ragweed, kochia, horseweed, I know as we're moving west, kochia is important. Um, and then also common cockleburr. So these are some of the products, if we can't remember, again, group two, uh, Beyond, Finesse, Pursuit, Classic, Amazepic. Um, these are some of the group two herbicides you might be spraying. So if you once saw these herbicides killing your weeds and now they are not, and you're pretty confident, your sprayer is calibrated correctly, it could be a resistance issue. Glyphosate resistance, really we don't need a map for glyphosate resistance. Glyphosate resistance is widespread throughout Oklahoma. 
We have glyphosate resistance in our pigweeds, um, in kochia, and horseweed. Unfortunately, I did recently get a sample in um, where a producer is having difficulty controlling Johnson grass with glyphosate, which we haven't confirmed yet. Um, I need to collect some more seed. We've been frustrated that glyphosate isn't killing many of our broadleafs, but we still keep saying it's doing a good job on our grasses. Unfortunately, it might not be doing a good job on our grasses forever. So just the importance of not using it too often. Um, and then I think this is important to this group, kochia. We know with um, the new oxen tolerant technologies like Enlist and Extend Flex, we're going to be spraying more oxens um, over the top of crops, so 2,4-D and dicamba. And we already have kochia that is resistant to dicamba in the state of Oklahoma. I don't know about 2,4-D. Um, and I would say fluoroxapir, which is star rain. I would put, that probably should be a yes with no question mark. Most of the molecular weed scientists <clears throat> are finding that if your kochia can't be killed with dicamba, it also cannot be killed with fluoroxapir, which is star rain. And that's not a really popular product in Oklahoma. Um, it's kind of, I would say, more of a Pacific Northwest product, but in case you're using it. Photosystem 2 inhibitors, atrazine, starting to see uh, resistance again in our pigweeds. I told you that pigweed is on every single slide. Uh, PPO resistance, so Valor, Authority. I don't work in summer crops, but um, I asked for update, updates on resistance from our row crop weed scientists and summer crops, and that's Todd Bauman, he's in Ardmore. Again, good old Palmer Amaranth. And then I work in winter crops, mostly in wheat, and so a plant that I spend a lot of time on, and maybe some of you are telling me that you're grazing, this is Italian ryegrass, so if you, if you do want ryegrass in your field, you can ignore this part of my talk. Um, but also seeing some resistance with group one herbicides, which would be Axial XL, Panoxidin, um, sister products would be Select, Clethodim, or Assure 2, which is Quizalifop. All of those products kill in the exact same way. They kill this enzyme called ACCase. And we're starting to see um, some resistance with ryegrass. And then I got some samples. I, right when I moved here, I got some samples of Palmer. This is HPPD resistance. These are our pigment inhibitors. So any herbicides that you're applying that bleach the leaves and you see white weeds. Um, I got some questions about using mostly husky and sorghum. And these are plants that were sprayed with um, a 3x rate of husky, so also have HPPD resistance. So if you have palmer or any kind of pigweed, which most of us do and are dealing with in our summer and winter crops, it is a challenge. Okay, so that was all really negative start. Um, I do want to talk about some areas where we aren't seeing resistance yet and maybe some things to watch. So glufosinate, we're largely replacing a lot of our glyphosate use, especially in summer crops with glufosinate. We don't have any documented glufosinate in the state. Um, we talked quite a bit about pendimethalin, trifluralin, our yellow herbicides. Um, Surfland would fit into that category as well. All of our root inhibitors, no resistance documented with those. Our shoot inhibitors, so think dual, warrant, uh, pyroxysulfone, Zidua, Anthem Flex, no resistance to those. Nucleic acid inhibitor, MSMA, maybe I shouldn't have put that up there. We don't have any documented resistance to MSMA. And then also Paraquat Diquat. Um, of course, burn down for broadleafs. We seem to be replacing glyphosate with Paraquat. Um, we don't have any documented resistance, but we do have documented resistance in other states in the US. So we are seeing resistance with Paraquat. So if you like Paraquat burn down, 
to get your pigweeds and some of those other plants, be selective in when you're using it because we, we do see that plants are able to um, evolve resistance to it. So I mostly focus on grass control. I'm going to talk about broadleaf control as well. Um, when I first moved to Oklahoma, and I always kind of put myself in a category that I was pretty good at weed ID, but we have a lot of bromus species in Oklahoma, and they're really difficult to ID at this seedling stage before they seed out. Um, who deals with bromes? I'm hoping at least some people do. Okay, so some of the plants, um, grass control and wheat, true cheat, Japanese brome, True cheat is our brome that gets up pretty tall above our wheat canopy. Japanese brome has these kind of curly ons. They're oftentimes at more of like a 90 degree angle. We also have downy brome. Um, you can see how hairy it is, although we see hair on a lot of the brome, so they are difficult to identify. And then the one that I think is most important um, that if you don't have in your fields yet could be popping up is rescue grass. Has anyone seen this plant? It has a very flat seed head. It's really unique to Oklahoma. Um, and I don't, when I go to national meetings, I don't hear of other states complaining about it as much as we do. So I don't know why we have it the most here, but we do. It is not hairy like the other bromes. Again, that flat head or that seed head is flat. You can pinch it between your fingers and it's incredibly difficult to kill. It does not respond to the other herbicides like downy brome and um, the other two that I talked about. So be on the lookout. Yeah, it's a nightmare. So if you don't have it now and you're ignoring me, that's okay. But you may, <laughs> when you get it, you'll wish that you paid attention right now. It is kind of like the palmer of the grasses. It's incredibly adaptive, so its goal is, is to produce offspring. And so even if it comes up at the end of it, the growing season, you're right, it can be a couple inches and it's going to produce seed because that's how it measures success. I'm producing babies. So um, yeah, that is the plant. One thing about rescue grass, and I'm going to show a slide on, on this in a minute, it is the very first winter annual grass that emerges. So when you're thinking about winter annuals, those plants that are coming up in the fall and they're setting flowering, setting seed now, it's the very first one that you're going to see up in the fall. And so we can be strategic with planting date um, as a tool to manage it because the herbicides perform so poorly on it. Um, so Gary Strickland, um, who's in southwest Oklahoma, has been doing some work on rescue grass for longer than me. Um, and I wanted to show some of the data. So we do have some pre-emergence products that we can use um, before rescue grass has emerged and before wheat has emerged. So we have Prepare, um, Olympus. These are all tank mixed with glyphosate because at the time he went out in a no-till field, there were some plants that were already up. So the pre-emergence herbicides, they bring something, um, but they're not great standalone, which is kind of like what we see with most pre's, just like Prowl with the Sandbur. Um, the best way to kill, so this is, this is conventional wheat, so I'm gonna talk about Clearfield here in a minute. Uh, PowerFlex and Outrider are really the, the two post products that you have to manage the bromes in wheat. Um, they'll do great on the True Cheat, on the Downy Brome um, and Japanese Brome. They'll do okay on, on the rescue grass and timing is really important. So you can see this is a fall application. And this is what happens when we wait until the spring, we start to go down. So anytime those winter annual weeds go through that semi-dormancy period, they're going to be more difficult to kill in the spring. Um, oh, having trouble too now, Brian. Let's see. Okay, there we go. 
Um, so here's fall and spring applications. Really the best way to kill rescue grass if you have it and you don't want to rotate out is with Beyond and Clearfield wheat, which I know is incredibly expensive and probably economically doesn't make the most sense. Um, but if you're telling me you want to stay in wheat, this is an option. We're oftentimes getting fairly good control with Beyond uh, for rescue grass control. So here's a picture. This is in Yukon. This field was just a solid rescue grass um, stand. You can see all around it. This is the best treatment. Amazamox Beyond with methylated seed oil, which we can use on our two gene Clearfield varieties. It looks okay. <laughs> Honestly, I told this producer this treatment is too expensive to make any kind of sense, and this field needs to be rotated out. Um, and so I think he planted sesame that following season and was able to use some grass herbicides. And that just made a lot more sense because it, it's so tough to kill. Um, this is what I am most excited about. I think planting date for rescue grass control, if you do have it, this is the difference between two weeks. I know the forage wheat producers don't like that delay in planting date, but if you have rescue grass fields that you want to keep in wheat, that you are okay with a little bit of flexibility because rescue grass comes up first, we can let it emerge. We can either burn it down with glyphosate if you're no-till, or we can go in with tillage. This was a tillage pass. And this on the right is dying, kind of dying rescue grass that was sprayed with PowerFlex. And this back there was sprayed with nothing, but we were able to go through and kill the rescue grass before the wheat came up, um, before planting that second date. So you can't do this with all species, especially ones that have multiple flushes, but rescue grass seems to have a really nice, solid flush early in the season, and so it works. I just went out to another producer um, place in Okarchi a couple weeks ago and saw this exact same thing. He said, this field is completely clean and I don't know why, but I did plant November 5th. And then I said, well, can you take me to a fallow area? And we went out and it was just solid rescue grass. So I, I think this is interesting. Um, there are some other products that we can use in wheat that go out at a timing that's called delayed pre-emergence. Um, that timing is a little bit unique we usually go out, it's not a true pre, so we wait for wheat to come up. Once it's spiked and we have a stand that we're happy with, there's a couple of products that we can use. Um, and they're, they're really the most effective on Italian ryegrass. So if Italian ryegrass is something that you want to manage and you're concerned with grain quality or not having other winter annual grasses in your wheat, there's two products that are really effective. One is produced by BASF, it's called Zidua, and FMC also produces another product called Anthem Flex. Same active ingredient, pyroxysulfone. Once we have wheat spiked, we put it out. We do need an incorporation because it kills weeds as they're germinating. Um, in Here's the Anthem Flex, also seeing good control. I want to show the picture because I think you guys will probably like the picture better. We can get to it. Um, this was 2016-17. I went out with my applications and within a few days later, I had some really nice rains. For a pre, that's great. In your dry years, like 16-17 or 16-17-18, I had my first rain about five weeks after I applied these products. So my control didn't look great. So just depending on rainfall, you have to be strategic in your application. You do need to be looking for when rains are coming um, and kind of do the best that you can. Folks that use it in a, in a timely rain 
fall. They tell me they love it. And then if you used it and you've been burned and you didn't get that rain, then they probably tell me that they hate it. So we do have to kind of watch the forecast, unfortunately, when we're using our pre-emergence products. And same would go for Prowl when we're talking about in Sandberg control. Um, Pre's can be frustrating, but unfortunately, we still need them. I don't know that this is the best table to show. There is a fact sheet that I just put out, put out on Italian ryegrass management and wheat. And basically, the take home was, if you're using some of these pre's, residue can be important. So just like having a timely rainfall, most of these labels will tell you if you have greater than 25% ground cover, you may see decreased efficacy with these products. And that's just because those herbicides have to come in contact with the soil. Um, so I'm doing some tillage work right now with Jason Warren looking at these products, trying to understand how much residue matters. Can we push our carrier volume to 15, 20 gallons per acre and maybe see it work? I don't have all the answers yet, um, but I can tell you in 17, when I had nice rainfall and I was in more of a conventional till environment, the weed control was excellent. In 2018, I had quite a bit of residue and we didn't have that rainfall. So those are two things that are going to set back the performance um, of this delayed pre-herbicide. Um, there is another delayed pre. It is an older product, but it's a Bayer product, Axiom. It's flufenicet plus metribuzin. Um, it's still around and it still does a good job. I'm not showing a very nice picture of it because it is a product where it has metribuzin in it, which we all know as the old trade name Sencor. And we can see some injury with metribuzin um, that's typically dependent on variety. Um, this is just kind of a note that if you are using any of these pre-products, looking at the labeled rate is going to be incredibly important. So if you have a sandier soil, you basically have less surface area that you need to apply herbicide to, so your rate is going to be lower. If you have a clay soil, something that has a lot of surface area, your rate's likely going to be higher. Um, so just pay attention. This was actually a field site that I used, and it was my first year. I can't remember what company. I don't think it was for Bayer. It was for a competing company. I was like, oh my gosh, like I screwed up. I mixed wrong. And I looked at the protocol, and I said, no, I mixed right. And so I called them, and he goes, oh, I forgot you're on a sandy soil. Our rate was way too high. So still kind of my fault. I probably should have caught that. But both of us, we learned. So now I know. This is my sandy field. I can't go out at eight ounces per acre. I need to drop it to six, four to six. Um, so things to learn no matter what system you're in, using pre's, you're gonna have a range for soil type. So this is kind of a planting gap right here. You can see this non-treated, this is probably hard to see, but basically in this second plot, that's solid Italian ryegrass. And this is what it should look like in a year where pyroxysulfone is, is doing a good job. It's, it's clean and it's season long clean. So it is one of those herbicides that's going to hang out in the soil until the next spring, which is nice. Um, cost is important. Companies always get mad at me when I show cost slides because it can vary depending on where we are, but I think cost is important. So Here's some kind of average prices, Zidua, Anthem Flex, nine to sixteen dollars per acre, Axiom 13, Metrobuzin, we're typically not applying alone, we're usually adding it um, at a couple of ounces, two dollars, and then Axial XL, um, which goes out post once ryegrass is up, around sixteen dollars an acre. So these are very ballpark prices. The other grass, and then I'm going to switch to broadleafs, and maybe some of you are going to say, finally, I don't care about grass control. I don't know. Um, barrel rye control, I want to talk a little bit about it. Really, the only tool that we've had in Oklahoma has been Beyond and Clearfield Wheat. 
they recently, not too recent, but fairly recently have changed their label to only offer suppression. So basically we have zero herbicides labeled that say we, it will control feral rye in wheat. Um, there is a new wheat production system that you'll be probably hearing more about. That's called coaxium wheat. Has anyone heard about this system yet? Okay, so coaxium wheat, the only herbicide tolerant wheat system we now have in Oklahoma is Clearfield. We now have a second one that's gonna be called coaxium and these are the partners involved, Colorado State University and their wheat commission, Alba Chemical and then Lima Grain on the seed side. So if you start hearing about this system and someone's trying to sell it to you, I just wanna make sure that you know what it is and what it offers. Um, so the system, just like Clearfield, will be called coaxium, but totally different herbicide. The trait will be called axigen, and the herbicide we use is gonna be called aggressor. Active ingredient is quizalifop. So if you have ever applied a sure 2 you have applied quizalifop. Who's applied a sure 2 Or select, or axial. Those are all killing weeds in a very similar way. They kill grasses only. Um, I've been looking at this new technology. It is commercially available, but in limited, um, in limited numbers and seed. This is the third year that we've been looking at it. Its performance on grass weeds like feral rye is excellent. Um, but what was one thing that I mentioned earlier about resistance in group ones? That I'm starting to see resistance for group one herbicides in Italian ryegrass. So if this is something that um, you think you might be interested in, just be very cautious again in using it in uh, a stewarded way every second year, every third year, um, because I think we already have resistance in the state of Oklahoma. So because this was developed in Colorado, the varieties that are available are not adapted to Oklahoma. Um, so Lima Grain has a couple, they'll say, I think LCX will be kind of their preface. And um, Oklahoma State has signed a licensing agreement to get this trait into OSU germplasm, but it will be some time. Um, so it'll be a tool, we'll be able to kill grass weeds. Um, but like any herbicide tolerant system, and I'll go back to the, what Brian said earlier about the Band-Aid, that's kind of what it is. So I'm a, I don't know that I'm that excited about it, um, but I think it'll be a tool for some of our really, our fields we don't want to take out a wheat where we have jointed goat grass, where we have feral rye, where maybe we have rescue grass and we're willing to spend some money, this could be an option. Um, and so here's the work. The other species that we've been looking at is rescue grass. Gary's mostly been doing this work around the Altus area, doing a good job on rescue grass. Um, and there's my reminder, again, that we do have resistance, so just to be cautious. Um, and here's kind of comparing. Someone asked me, how is the system going to be different from Clearfield? They are very different, but here's a couple of comparisons. So. What we know, Clearfield, we got post-emergence control and pre-emergence control of many of our grasses and broadleafs. Um, coaxium is only going to kill grasses when they're up. So absolutely zero residual and zero activity on broadleaf weeds. So you'll have to tank mix with a broadleaf herbicide. Okay, so take home on grasses and then I'm gonna switch to broadleaf control. Italian ryegrass, our delayed pre-emergence herbicides are working. So if you like using Axial, um, again, be cautious in how often you use it. Our bromes, if it's Japanese brome, True Cheat, um, we have products that are doing a pretty good job. If you have rescue grass, my advice would be to rotate out of that field um, and do some work in controlling it or delay your planting date.
Okay, so what about broadleafs? I hope I didn't waste too much time talking about grass weed control, but it looked like at least a couple of you were interested. Um, now I'm going to talk about broadleaf weed control, which might be more interesting, and I'll start with prices. So we have a number of auxins, right? Dicamba, Banville, 2,4-D, MCPA that we like to use. Um, in wheat, whether we're maybe going out early in the fall or we're mixing in with top dress in the spring. Um, we also have our ALS herbicides, so Finesse for broadleafs, Ally, um, Powerflex if we're trying to get grass control and broadleafs. We have a number of products that are working pretty well. Many of them have gone off patent with companies, so we can buy them as generics and we can spend a couple of dollars and get decent control. Um, there's a couple of herbicides that are newer to the market and you might be paying a little bit more. Um, and I, I wanted to see what their efficacy was and whether or not it was worth it cost-wise to use some of these newer products. So I haven't looked at them on every weed species. Um, where we kind of started was looking at them on horseweed, but we can talk about other broadleafs as well. Mare's tail. Um, something I try and remind folks is every once in a while, you know, as we're getting close to wheat harvest, I do get calls on harvest aids. Typically, kind of like the Cadillac harvest aid treatment is going to run you around $7 per acre if you're throwing everything at it. And so I try and remind folks that couple of these less expensive products is going to save us some cost up front if we make an application in the fall or spring or wherever is important to you. Um, so this might not be that interesting to you. You don't need to read this x-axis. Basically, I had a student who was looking at all of these products we just discussed on horseweed control. And what we found was, which isn't surprising, we can get to the next slide, there we go. When we have one to three inch rosettes, we know our auxins, 2,4-D, dicamba, MCPA, they do a pretty good job controlling most of our plants, unless we have resistance. When we start getting up above that four inch stage, whether it's rosette width or in height, we start to see a decrease in performance. So we know that about auxins. Herbicide timing is incredibly important. So looking at these same treatments, this is in Ponca City. These are four to seven inch rosettes. And you can see now many of our orange bars have been brought down, right? Some of our inexpensive treatments, couple of dollar treatments maybe aren't working as well as they were at the one to three inch timing. So here's 2,4-D and here's dicamba formulated as Banville. The ones that we starred, those are, um, those are treatments that contained Culex. So one objective of this research is, is I wanted to see what Culex did. I was hearing a lot about it. I wanted to see it on some weeds. Um, and so far for at least horseweed, and I would also say some of our mustards and primrose, it's doing a pretty good job. You're looking at about $5 per acre, so it might be a bit more expensive than dicamba alone or 2,4-D alone. But if you get out of that ideal timing, sometimes it's worth the investment. Um, it's a Corteva product, so was Dow, now is Corteva, and it has two active ingredients in the jug. It has an auxin, which is haloxifen, which is a new auxin, and it has fluoracillam, which is um, an ALS inhibitor. So a, a group two and a group four, if you remember numbers. Um, so I talked about resistance in grasses. We aren't able to get the control that we once did from our ALS products like Finesse and Ally on our grasses. Um, we are still seeing many of our broadleafs respond well to ALS herbicides. As my student Jody was doing this work, she did notice a couple of sites where she said, you know, the horseweed's just not responding very well to the Ally and the Finesse. 
do you think we have resistance? And I said, I don't know. I haven't been here for that long. <laughs> Let's collect seed and, and bring the samples in. And so she screened all of her sites, and she was able to document resistance. If you ever want to look at resistance documentation um, for Oklahoma or the country or actually the world, there is a web website, uh, weedscience.org, where we try and document this. So now for horseweed, we know that we do have ALS resistant species. Um, and this was some pictures that I saw uh, from a colleague just showing that you know, finesse plus MCPA, which is really a go-to uh, tank mix for broadleaf control, um, wasn't working so well on this population. This was in Texas, but I think we have the same resistance in Oklahoma. Um, but what replacing finesse with Culex was bringing, even though cost-wise it is a little bit more. Now, one thing, if you've been listening really carefully, so finesse is an ALS herbicide. MCPA is an auxin, MCPA, and then what did I say Culex was? Two products. It's an auxin and it has an ALS in it. So one thing that kind of confused me was, why is Culex doing such a better job than finesse when we supposedly have ALS resistance, but this has an ALS in it? And so I asked Corteva to send me just that ALS part of the herbicide alone. I think what we're seeing is it's not widespread resistance to all ALS chemistries. It's selective chemistries. So we have resistance probably to chlorosulfuron, which is glean, which is in finesse, to metsulfuron, which is also in finesse and is ally. But the ALS that's in Culex, which is fluoracilam, we don't have resistance. So it's not always widespread and it's complicated. And I'm going to try and learn some more about that. Um, some other broadleafs. So we looked at horseweed. These were some Culex treatments comparing with uh, the traditional finesse plus MCPA for bushy wallflower, henbit. Um, seeing similar trends for pepperweed. If you have any of the pepperweeds like Virginia or green flower, we actually did see that um, the traditional finesse plus MCPA was doing a better job than Culex. So it, it does depend on what species you have. And then Powerflux as well, which is going to bring grass control. So that product's going to be a little bit pricier. Um, some other research that I'm working on, um, and we can talk more if you think there's some, some other things we should be doing, but harvest aids, Palmer control in wheat or pigweed control in wheat. Um, I get a lot of questions about in the spring, I have pigweed flushes coming up, especially when the producer is double crop and they want to get the wheat out quickly and get beans in immediately. So I, I actually have a student who was moving here in the summer, and that's all she's going to be looking at. So hopefully we'll learn some things. One thing that has been good if, if you do um, have wheat and are looking to stay clean in the spring, Dioron or Direx has, has been a pretty good product, and that's the only one I've looked closely at. So hopefully I'll learn more. Um, oxen application in wheat. For the coaxium work, I have a student who's looking at um, basically sensitivity. So when we have this new herbicide tolerant system of coaxium, just like with Enlist and ExtendFlex, how many articles did we see about drift and tank contamination? I'm trying to learn how important that will be when we start spraying um, this new product in Oklahoma. Fallow weed management, trying to do some work and learn some things, and then also looking at um, how much that residue impacts our prees. <clears throat> so I'll end with a reminder again that I do run the resistance screening program. So if all you take away from this is that I have a plant and I'm not sure if it's resistant, you can collect seed. 
Um, if you need some guidance in how to collect seed from that plant, I'm more than happy to talk you through it. If you say you need someone to be there and help you, we have plenty of students and we drive around the state all the time and we're happy to come out. Um, but finding out what kind of resistance you have in your field is, is really important when we're trying to recommend a herbicide program. And there's my contact information and I'll be happy to answer any questions. It can go out as, as late as flag leaf and wheat for safety. And if you are no-till, your rotation interval is short. Like I wanna say they have a supplemental label. I think it's like 45 days. Our ALS herbicides like Finesse and Ally, we have long plant back intervals to go to many of our crops, especially our summer crops. So one thing about the Culex label is those rotations are shortened quite a bit. Um, and I'll double check for sesame. Well, from what you show me, it looks to me like it might be better on, on buckwheat than Finesse and MCPA. Yeah, I've looked, I didn't show buckwheat data, but I have looked at it and I mean, they both do a pretty good job.